Yes, so I teach in the pottery area, so I brought some clay with me. Um, it's in front of you. You can take it out, play with it, make something if you want. My ulterior motive here is I want to send you all home with a little dirt on your clothes <laughs> like I walk around with every day. Um, but before I start talking, um, maybe we can just take a couple moments just to be with that material, explore that material. So I thought I'd start today with a little story. Um, about 23 years ago, I was starting in graduate school at uh, the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University. And uh, Alfred's a small college in western New York. It's also been a pretty important program in ceramic art for the last hundred or so years. Um, they have a lot of faculty in ceramics. They had six when I was there. And each of them is kind of a legend in that field. Um, so I'm starting grad school there. I'm really nervous, excited, um, kind of romantic-minded young ceramic artist. And um, I'm sitting down in my studio for my first meeting with my graduate advisor, who's this legendary ceramist. And uh, the first thing she asks me is, so what do you want to make? And um, I thought about this, and I said to her very earnestly, um, well, I just want to figure out what the clay wants to be. And she started laughing out loud. <laughs> and, uh, and when she got done laughing, she said, honey, she was, she was from the South. <laughs> she, said, she said, honey, the clay doesn't want to be anything. The clay wants to be a lump. And uh, so I went back to my studio, properly chastened, and uh, got to work figuring out what I wanted to make. And over the last 20 or so years, um, these are some of the things I've been making. Um, I'm not going to talk about them specifically. It's not really that kind of talk. But this just gives you a visual sense of some of the sculptures I make out of clay more or less the same material you're holding in your hands. But at the same time, over the last 20 years, um, I kept thinking about that question. What does the clay want to be? About five years ago, I started working on this project called the Ceramic Materials Atlas. Um, the idea behind this project is pretty simple. It was just to look at all the clays and other materials that we use in the pottery studio at CSU and then trace them back uh, through the supply chain to their site of extraction, uh, to their geologic origins in the earth. And through the, this project, we're trying to think about these materials not just epistemologically or teleologically, in other words, in terms of information or how they're useful to humans, but also think about them ontologically as material beings. So the clay you're holding in your hands um, is what's called a clay body. We mix these clay bodies in the studio from a range of different clays and other minerals and water to achieve these really specific aesthetic and practical qualities. Um, the fundamental quality of clay is this ability to roll it into a coil and form it into the thin shell of a pot. And this is called plasticity. And this comes from a really particular microscopic structure. We can think of the structure that creates plasticity as the result of a long and intricate process of material meaning unfolding in deep geologic time. The main clay in this clay body was mined near what is now the border of Kentucky and Tennessee. The clay was deposited there around 50 million years ago during the hot and humid climate of the Eocene. 
during the Eocene, because of much higher sea levels, this area was right on the Gulf of Mexico. And the clay was deposited there in tidal pools after a long journey downhill from the Appalachian Mountains. But this clay began its life even earlier, around a billion years ago, as a set of aluminate and silicate minerals held inside of granitic rock. Granites form when the lithosphere is pushed downward into the Earth's hot mantle and begins to melt. The Earth's crust starts to melt around 800 degrees Celsius, and at these high temperatures, the minerals in granite are relatively stable. But as granite is pushed up towards the surface, they begin to cool and become less so. During the Eocene, the atmosphere was really rich in carbon, and water mixed with carbon forms a mild acid. Ancient Eocene acidic rain falling in the Appalachian Mountains, as the granites decompose, their alumina and silica combine with the water in the atmosphere to create a new mineral called kaolinite. Over millions of years, this process of water opening up and interweaving with the structure of granite forms clay. The clay you're holding in your hands is made from the dust of ancient mountains. Microscopic hexagonal plates that form within the kaolinite give the material its plasticity. The surfaces of these plates attract water so that when force is introduced by the pressure of your fingers, they slide against each other and then lock into place. From this fundamental quality of plasticity, over 25,000 years of pottery has issued forth. Clay is this incredible material. It comes straight out of the ground all over our planet. It's highly responsive to touch. It holds every mark. As it dries, it hardens. So you can build really large things without armatures or other tools. And when it's fired in a kiln, it turns back into an aluminum silicate rock. And it'll remain in that form for tens of thousands of years. Yet through much of modern Western thought, we've described ceramic objects as primarily, if not purely, the product of exclusively human creativity. In this teleological way of thinking, intelligent and industrious humans shape passive, inert, dumb matter. The clay only wants to be a lump. But there are other ways to think about this. We can also remember that like the clay, our own bodies are made from water, carbon, and minerals from the surface of the earth. We, like the clay, are made from the dust of ancient mountains. An idea from the field of crafts, of which my work is very much a part, is that we think through making. We think with materials. And by this, in the crafts, we mean not that the clay is some inert external tool put to use by our human intelligence, but rather that our hands and the clay we shape become a material part of the mind as the mind makes the mind, a work of continuously becoming. The pot wouldn't be formed into this thin shell of a vessel without its interaction with the intelligence of a human material body but neither would a human create this shape if not for the interaction with the intelligence held within the material body of the clay. Like pots, ideas are material things. Ideas are made things. An idea only recently emerging within Western new materialist philosophies has been held in the thinking and practices of indigenous cultures for millennia. And a seed of this thought might go something like this that we begin by taking seriously the ethical imperative to engage with other human beings, not as a means to an end, but as ends in themselves. And we then also extend that ethical imperative and work to engage all material beings, not only as means to an end, but also as ends in themselves. This is a reminder that the human beings sitting at your table are like the clay you are holding in your hands. 
both parts of the material intelligence of our planet unfolding in geologic time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.